good morning. <clears throat> well, I have uh, bad news. Democracy is in crisis. And I have good news. Democracy has always been in crisis. So you will understand from this uh, start that my analysis of populism is very much related to democracy. And in my view, we can understand populism only in relation with democracy. Uh, as, as it has been mentioned by Massimo Latore, uh, the concept of populism has been stretched extensively and probably too much, at least for my own uh, judgment, for my taste, to uh, uh, systems or to situations where uh, social movements, protests, etc., against uh, given regimes were expressing themselves, but actually not within the framework of a democratic system. So in non-democratic systems, you can try to, to throw the regime, or you can make a revolution. Populism is related to the, to, I would say, to a different understanding of what democracy uh, is about. Or perhaps to summarize it in, in a nutshell, the vocabulary of populism and, democra and democracy is more or less identical. The grammar is different. The combination is different. But we, we start from the very same concepts. The concepts are translated, are understood in a different way. I have to say that it has taken me a long time to come to this conclusion. Actually, uh, I signed a contract with a French editor, a publisher, excuse me, a French publisher, in 1992. But it took me a long time to write the book because in the meantime I had been appointed at EUI and EUI, the European University Institute, was probably too demanding to leave me the time to write the book. So actually my first book on populism was only in 2002. And at the time, when I signed the contract, the study of populism would have been probably a kind of theoretical reflection on populism. In 2002, it could already be based on empirical data. And I'm not speaking of 2020. We have the embarrassment of richness of populism everywhere, not only in Europe, but in, in the world. So we are facing, democracies are facing some forms of uh, disenchantment. And we can organize these uh, forms of disenchantment according to the, uh, uh, the paradigm suggested by uh, uh, Albert Hirschman, exit voice and loyalty. Uh, people are not any more loyal to democracies, and they are more voicing or exiting. And we have obviously more examples of uh, voices, and for a long time, probably political parties have not really taken care too much about these many voices expressing their discontent vis-a-vis -vis democracy. There was electoral abstention, anomy, uh, to use uh, Durkheim uh, wording, people not interested in politics. That was, I would say, the, the milder form of uh, expression uh, of people. There was electoral volatil volatility. For instance, in the 80s and 90s, it was quite common to talk about Parteienstaat, Partitocratia, Partitocracy, and the parties in government were able to, to gather as much as 80, even 90% of the total votes. Today, a party can consider uh, it as successful if he is able to collect 30, 35% of the vote. Only two countries today are run by a single party, 
Great Britain, but we know that behind the scene, Great Britain is much more divided than it appears through electoral results, and Hungary. All the other countries are run by coalitions, and coalitions which are often uh, constituted, framed, created on the basis of despair. That is, how can we make, how can we construct a government given the fragmentation of the electorate? So decline of party government. More fundamentally, a lack of trust vis-a-vis -vis elite and institutions. It's quite common to say that a society can function properly only if trust, if there is trust between people. And it does not matter the kind of institutions. Uh, governments function well if there is trust. The mafia functions properly if there is trust between the mafiosi. It's a different type of trust, but it, it's, it's a the kind of uh, informal, non-written uh, commitment vis-a-vis -vis the partner, vis-a-vis -vis the other. And we have escalated further with protest and what has been called dégagisme. Dégagisme is a French word which has been used by the protesters in Tunis. Dégage means go out. Go out. And there is some irony, for instance, in the French case, when the political parties, which were desperately looking for solutions in order to remobilize uh, public opinion and followers, decided to use the primary system as a way of selecting candidates. They had totally forgotten that the primary system has been invented and inserted in the American political systems by the populist party, by the people party, at the end of the 19th century. So uh, we have still some remnants of the past with the Caucasus, as we have seen uh, recently uh, in the United States. But today, uh, three quarters and more of the American states use primaries. We, the people. And the primaries imported in Europe have been used as instruments of dégagisme. So you do not choose your preferred candidate. You eliminate those you, that you dislike. So it's really a, 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 a strange phenomenon that political parties, in order to rescue themselves, have imported, without knowing it, uh, populist instruments and institutions in order to... Uh, and what strikes me now, at the, at the stage where we are today, is the uh, growing violence which, uh, which uh, emerged in the protest against uh, political systems. Um, recent statistics published both by the British government and the French government show uh, a huge increase of uh, violence, and in particular of uh, eight crimes, racist crimes, anti-Semitic crimes, and the growth is huge. Well, you could, con you could say, well, reporting is better. I am ready to accept it. But uh, it's not only related to reporting of crimes. It's related to an objective increase of violence in <coughs> our societies, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, in my own uh, country. It's not only political violence, it's also social violence, which uh, gives uh, uh, really <coughs> uh, a view of, of the situation which is quite negative. How, do, how can we explain this democratic malaise? We have multiple causes, multiple tr triggers, but the consequences are, are, are similar. And these causes are rather well known, and I will go fast. We have, you have ideological causes. That is, for instance, the ideological glue which existed at the time of the communist uh, uh, regime, both in these countries and in our countries, have disappeared. 
there is also the failure of the social democratic parties to consolidate their grips on a part of the population. And I think there are many reasons for that. The first one is the conversion of social democratic parties to the neo neoliberal paradigms. And it was indeed difficult for them not to accept these uh, neoliberal paradigms at the time of globalization. You know, it was much easier to refute them, to refuse them uh, when economies were mainly national uh, economies. The emergence of new values. I mentioned on the slide a slogan that I saw on a commercial poster in Florence in 2009. Universe, universe, written in the way it is here. That is, you are the universe. I am the universe. So uh, it's telling of both the technological revolution which supports this exacerbated individualism and also of the new conception of the world, that is, you are not interested in groupings, you are not interested in unions, you are not interested in political parties, you are interested in yourself and projecting yourself through technological uh, means. You have also more and more single-issue movements, because if you don't have parties which are in a position to propose coherent or cohesive uh, programs, uh, well, you are left with your preferred uh, issues. Uh, I signed once a manifesto supporting, I don't remember which cause. But the fact that I have signed once means that now every day, every day, I receive invitations to sign for at least four or five causes. So I click and uh, it disappears. But for anything, for the protection and of cats, for uh, uh, protesting against uh, people put in jail in uh, Iran, you know, from the ridicule to, uh, to, the, to the major issues, so single issues. You have also socio-economic revolutions, and I think it's worth considering these uh, socio-economic revolutions, because in my view, we are in a situation comparable to what happened once at the end of the 19th century, which was the first globalization between, let's say, 1870s, 80s, and uh, first globalization, which ended up tragically with the First World War. And at that time, we were in a situation similar to, to the one today, that is, technological revolution, communication revolution, transport revolution, that was a time where uh, for instance, the two canals of Suez and, and Panama were open. Uh, boats moved from sail to, uh, to engines, etc. And there was also a production revolution, which was a Fordist, re later on, what we have called the Fordist revolution. And today we are just taking the reverse, that is uh, breaking up the Fordist revolution into an extremely segmented uh, <coughs> uh, labor, labor market. So we it was a great transformation, and uh, in my view, we are facing, uh, again, such a great uh, transformation. You had also structural transformations from national to international companies to global firms, from regulated national markets to neoliberal globalizations, from state regulation to soft law and self-regulations, for instance. The bankers have escaped regulation by the state, pretending that they would self-regulate themselves in order to limit their, their pay. And you, you might wonder, but why have not we regulated the banker's salary uh, as it could have been possible, let's say, 50 years ago? But it's very simple. If you 
regulate too much your bankers in France or in Italy or in Estonia. You have no bankers anymore. They flew all to the city. They have already done it for a big part. But it, national regulations are powerless in a global system. We had also more insidious political transformations. The first one is that politicians, policymakers, are not able to deliver their electoral commitments. In a certain way, the political parties have kept the same rhetoric, the same language than they used to have uh, 50 years ago. We will do this, we will do that. For instance, just a small, a small example because it's ridiculous. Uh, the mayor of Paris has uh, proclaimed uh, last week that she will plant 170,000 trees if elected. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Except that during her first term, she managed to plant 20,000. And she also forgot that the total number of trees in Paris, including the big parks, are 180,000, which would mean that she would plant more trees in six years than over the past 100 years. So this kind of uh, electoral pro proclamations cannot be fulfilled. So people don't believe in it, and they say, well, just politicians. Ju judicialization of politics. I was among, let's say, those who acclaim the fact that politics was much more controlled by higher courts, by Supreme Courts. And I think it's, a, by many standards, it's a big progress. But at the same time, we have to realize that every time a court takes a stand on one issue, it means that politicians are not able anymore to intervene. I would like to give you, again, another concrete example uh, <clears throat> taken from recent French experience. On the basis of vague arguments in the <clears throat> proclamations of rights in the French Constitution, the Constitutional Council has decided that it was not conformed to the Constitution to ask students to pay fees for their studies. It has huge policy implications, since the councils had that only small registration fees can be requested. To give you a clue, French students, or foreign students in France, pay 250 euros per year, including social, social security. So, if a few, a few, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a few cases where students pay more because they are in master's program, for instance. But just to show how the political actions of government is limited by this judicialization of, uh, of politics. Growing external constraints, that's everybody has this in mind. But I would like to refer only for the time being, for instance, to the implications of trade treaties. Trade treaties are not anymore about uh, taxes and customs taxes, etc. Trade treaties are treaties which are full of norms, social, environmental, technical standards, and without perceiving it, without knowing it, we realize 10 years after the signature of the treaty that we can do this or we can't do that. And this has been negotiated through treaties. So we impose our norms to other countries and the other countries impose also their norms we have accepted to ourselves. And it's an invisible 
totally invisible way of making policy these days. And it has huge impact on the economic and social fabric of every country. Finally, the 2008 financial crisis. I don't see it as a cause. I see it as an accelerator. You know, uh, and if I can testify with my own experience, as I, again, I, I negotiated a contract with a publisher in 1992. It was, so it, the financial crisis is a ter tremendous push in favor of populism, but not the cause. Well, now <coughs> we are faced with uh, internal contradictions, which are very well known, but which are crucial. Contradiction between market and democracy, what Robert Dahl called <coughs> an unhappy couple, because this relationship is, is and clearly, for the past 30 or 40 years, there is one dominant member in the couple, the market, much more powerful than uh, the political systems. There are contradictions and tensions between the two components of the, any democratic system. Because, uh, for instance, there is an extremely interesting book which has just been published by Nadia Urbinati, entitled Me, the People, and it's a fascinating book, but I think sh there is one flaw in, uh, in her book. That is, she takes democracy as it is today for granted. That is, democracy is democracy. There is not much need to uh, define democracy. Uh, I have a completely opposite view to that. That is I, what I call democracy is a bricolage. Bricolage because Democracy is constituted, is made of elements which have nothing to do with the democratic principle. The rule of law has not in, in, been invented by Democrats. The first signs of the rule of law have been little by little introduced in monarchical systems. Probably the best advocate of the Reichstag was Frederick Frederick II, which was not really a Democrat. Uh, the welfare system has not been invented by Democrats. It has been invented by Bismarck. It has been increased by Pétain, Mussolini, Hitler. Uh, so these elements, which are today considered as constitutive of, very, uh, of a true democratic systems, are not really part of it. So democracy is a bricolage. It, and my thesis would be that today, we are facing a challenge, we are facing a crisis, we, which will permit a new form of bricolage. I don't think populism can survive as it would like to survive in the long term. But I don't think we will be able to forget completely about populism. Because we live on conventions. We live on the conventions that the people is the sovereign, but the people does not exist. We have majorities, we have groupings. The people is an abstract concept to, re to reduce the million of individuals to one single entity, the people. So it's very convenient because everybody can use the people as if he was the owner of the concept. And it's, populists are often criticized for pretending that they are the people, we the people. But actually, all politicians without exception, all, once elected, start their speech by saying, well, I am very grateful to my electorate, to those who have voted for me, but from tomorrow, I will run the country for the people, for each of us. There is no politician which does not start in that way, that is pretending to represent the whole. And what is the people, actually? The people is the part who pretends to be the whole. It's an old uh, story. So 
what has happened? We had this unexpected coupling between the popular sovereignty and liberalism. And we should not, we should never forget that liberalism was anti-democratic. Liberalism was perceived as a limitation of the power of the people. And over the past two centuries, there has been a long march towards a, a better balance, a better equilibrium between the popular sovereignty which has grown and the liberalism which has slightly diminished in a certain way, that is a limitation to the popular sovereignty. But the past 50 years, I've seen the reverse, that is, the popular leg has remained extremely meager. It has not changed. We have elections every four, five, six years, only that. And we have the liberal component of our institutions, which have grown to limits. So, in a way, the populism reaction, the populism protest, is, can be explained by, the, by, by this new imbalance between the two legs of the democratic body. Uh, well, we can, we can uh, skip that. Yes, a single bed for two dreams. Uh, I borrow this expression from a French journalist who applies this to, uh, to the tension between <laughs> East and West at the time. So uh, the single bed was the world, and the two dreams were the Soviet and the American dream. But it applies very well also to populism and to, the, and to democracy. That is, we have a single bed, which is democracy. But we have two dreams, two different visions. The one which is based on representation, on delegation, on mediation, and the other, we pretend that the uh, entire people can mobilize itself, can express its views, can be part every day, etc., cetera, in, in, in political uh, life. So, from this point of view, populism is just an exacerbation in many ways of a tension which has always existed in uh, democratic politics. But there is one major innovation, social network, social media. This is a major innovation and I don't know what will be the impact on the fabric of democracy in, in, in the future, because the technical, <laughs> technological revolution, the social media, exacerbate, as I said before, the individual. The communication uh, between people is not a discussion. It's just, this is my opinion. And as uh, uh, argues a populist, any opinion has the same value, which means also a kind of anti-scientific speech and attitude, because everybody can, well, if, if Earth is flat, it's flat. If vaccines are counterproductive, let's say that vaccines uh, are dangerous. You know? So every opinion can express and coagulate with some other's opinion. It speech is now a common feature. Hmm? Again, uh, another example taken from uh, the French uh, political scene. Uh, a few months ago, Macron went to visit a, a Jewish cemetery which had been vandalized by some kind of Nazi or uh, people. And the, 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 the visit was transmitted on TV, live, and people could react. And after 10 minutes, the TV network decided to stop the live reactions of people. Such were the racist, anti-Semitic reactions awful. So this gives an idea of the, how much violence and hatred attitudes are in society, that anonymity of the social media and technology allow to diffuse and to, to disseminate. So the miracle, the democratic miracle, 
was permitted by the, the grafting of the democratic ideal and of the principle of representation inv invented by the British. And we can say that we have lived on that graft for the past uh, two or three centuries. This grafting is challenged today uh, by the new technologies which allows the expression of every individuality. So what will be the form of the democratic regimes tomorrow? Will it be possible to create uh, new forms of solidarity, new forms of solidarity, new forms of sociability beyond these billions of individuals expressing their opinions. Challenge, risk, benefits. Challenge, how to rebalance the equilibrium between globalization of markets and national politics. Because there is one big issue that I have not mentioned yet. Democracy has been invented in national settings. All democracies are Westphalians. They are all national. We do not know how to deal with democracy at a supranational level. There is a small attempt at the European level, but which is extremely disappointing. Precisely because, I would say, the elites, the political elites or technocratic elites, don't want to introduce democracy at the supranational level. And we have to reinvent a kind of bricolage again. There is no miraculous recipe, but we have to try to find out solutions allowing an improvement of democracy at supranational level. And we have to do it. Because if we don't do it, the only alternative, and there is no other alternative, is to come to the Trump solution. America first. Germany first. Estonia first. Except that obviously some countries such as America or China have probably some uh, sound basis for saying we first. When it comes to other countries, it's much, less, it's much less easy to do. The risk, anarchy, demagogy, authoritarian leadership, individualism, nationalism, welfare chauvinism, all issues that we observe already, anti-migrant policies. But there are some benefits. Not, you know, not everything is black. First of all, we have a turnover of elites. In many countries, populism is equivalent to a kind of post-revolution or post-regime uh, area. That is, finally, uh, old elites are put aside and new elites are emerge. Not always for the best, but at least there is some turnover, some possibility of change. So that's a good thing. There is also a pressure for rebalancing the equilibrium between, between the populist, popular, excuse me, popular dimension and the liberal dimension. And this is also, in my view, uh, uh, necessary. For instance, we have not, uh, I'm really look for the reflection by a study by a lawyer to uh, consider the transformation of fundamental rights, because there is a kind of uh, uh, progressive evolution through which every right, every right becomes a fundamental right. And every right becomes my right. The, and it becomes equated to the defense of interest, to self-interest. So th I think there is a good field of reflection for lawyers on that. And it's also uh, an invitation to rethink the nature of democracy. Because as I said, democracy is not a fixed uh, system. It has been a very, very evolutive system. And if you don't believe me, 
reread De la Democracy en Amérique by Tocqueville. What he analyzed as democracy is a terrible regime. Terrible. You know, slavery, plutocracy. Uh, you know, we would not consider it as, as, as a, a democracy. And the populist revolt of the late 19th century has brought in America a certain number of innovations which are still in place today. The election of the Senate by universal suffrage, for instance, the primary system, the income tax, are byproducts of the populist revolt of the 19th century. So my, my forecast, if I may, uh, I am at an age where I can make forecasts because I will not uh, observe their fulfillment. So, it's, uh, so my forecast is that there would be an integration of these populist claims in a new democratic system. How and how much? Well, it would depend on countries because there is not a single democracy which is similar to the other. There is huge variations across time and space and uh, that's the life of democracy. Thank you.